trying to work it up to be moving stuff around all the time up here. So, on Christmas Day, 1863, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was depressed. His beloved wife had died in a house fire two years before, and his son had been severely wounded in the Civil War. In the depths of his sad sadness over the ongoing war, the state of the world, his own per personal pain, he penned a Chris Christmas poem that reflected his hope in the power of God in the midst of all, of all the strife. If sadness weighs heavily on our hearts this Christ, this Christ, Christmas, we too can find hope in the so sovereign Lord who will one day right all wrongs and reign over heaven and earth. And he wrote this poem that we just sang. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how, as this day had come, the uh, bel the belfries of all Christ of all Christ Christ Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's on the back of your bulletin today. This morning we're going to look at a message which I've called Men, Wise and Evil. And we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 2. Look at the first 12, verse, 12 verses of chapter 2 of Matthew. Now after Jesus was born in, Beth, in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So I'm saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is where the Christ was to be born? They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O, Beth, o Bethlehem, the land of, Ju of Judah, are by no means least among ru rulers of Ju Judah, for from you shall come a ru ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod, some of the wise men, seek secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Beth to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and wor worshipped him. Then opening their tre treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Men, wise and evil. Let's all pray. Father, as we, as we get into this time of the spoken word, Father, just thank you that we have your word to learn from. So Father, teach us the truths of this today. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now some translations call the wise men mad jai. We call them kings from the east. But I like the term wise men. Okay? This morning we're going to look at the wise men and the evil man. You see, there's a saying that goes like this, wise men still seek him, 
This is true, but I want you to hear me. Evil men are still trying to destroy him, or at least destroy every mention or knowledge of him. That still goes on in our world today. In this passage that we're going to look at, and we're going to see men, wise men, and an evil man. Matthew chapter 2 is a historical record of the coming of the wise men. Now, when we do major scenes, the wise men are always there, right? Shepherds are there, wise men are there. But were the wise men there? Think about this. Notice they came in the days of Herod the king, also called Herod the Great. The one thing that Herod did not want was competition, okay? In fact, the one thing that Herod would not tolerate was competition for his throne. I'm going to tickle my throat this morning, so... <clears throat> These wise men came to Jerusalem, and this would have just set King Herod off. Now, before we go any further, let's take a look at some historical facts of old Herod. Okay? Herod had bought his position. He wasn't really a king. He bought the position that he had. It was a paid-for thing, all right? And the whole Herod family, there were a bunch of crooks and thieves and murderers. They were, they were like the first century mafia. Herod the Great was probably the worst of all of them. As I said, he hated any kind of competition. Matter of fact, he had his oldest son murdered because he thought his son was trying to take his throne. Had his own son killed. That's the loving dad, right? Thanks, dad. Had his own son murdered. They were not of Israel. They weren't even Jews. They were foreigners, and Herod wanted to find this new threat to his throne. All right? So read with me chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, three wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Were you reading in your Bible? Were you reading in your Word? How many of your translations say three? Mine doesn't. Why do we say three wise men? Why do we have the major scene with three wise men? You ever thought about that? Yeah. We always say three. I don't believe three men would have made Herod nervous. I don't think three men showed up going, hey, where's the... He'd been like, really? I don't think three men would have bothered Herod. Matter of fact, he could have paid to have three men bumped off, but they made him nervous. Okay? It doesn't say there were three men. The wise men came from the east. We know that. It does not say they all came from the same place or the same town. So there could have been several groups that followed this sign and met up in Jerusalem. There could have been several groups that met up wherever else and all journeyed together to Jerusalem. We don't know for sure. All we know is what God's Word tells us, right? <clears throat> so three men probably wouldn't make Herod nervous. What if there was 30 or 40? What if there was 200 or 300? I want you to think about this. Let's get a really good picture of this. If there were just three magi, three wise men, and they were as important as we believe they were, because if they really were important, would they have traveled alone? If there were just three, they would have had their entourage with them. They had their cooks, they had the animal, the people taking care of all their animals, they had their, their guards with them. They would have had an, an entire entourage. It would have been a large group. I don't believe there was only three, but I also believe they had a lot of people with them. It made the entire town of Jerusalem nervous. They were all the talk. Who are these people? What are they doing here? Right? 
These were people of importance, people of wealth, people of affluence, right? And influence. They were important. Man, they would have had their cooks, their people take care of animals, their personal aides, their servants, as I said, their military with, with, with them. Make sure since they're important, they've got to be safe. There's, there's crooks on those roads, right? There was enough people in this group that when they showed up, Herod got nervous. He got nervous about it. It said it caused excitement in Jerusalem. Free men alone? Nope. They wouldn't have done it. It had to be a larger group. A group large enough to cause excitement and concern. They came from the east. They came from a long way off. They represented the best of what the Gentiles had to offer. Right? The noblest among them from all over the world. It is very possible that they had been influenced by the great religious leader, Zoroaster. And he, was, he had a movement which they worshipped a strange, unseen light. They thought God was an infinite spirit. Followers of this philosophy, they led exemplary lives and they believed in prayer and judgment and morality. So they were good people. Okay. These men were philosophers, priests, astronomers. Most of them lived in Persia or Arab or Arab or Arab Arab Arabia. I can't talk today. They were the learned men of the Eastern nations, devoted to astronomy, to religion, to medicine. They were held in high esteem by the Persian court. They were admitted as counselors. They followed groups and camps into war to give advice. I'm trying to show you how important these people were. They weren't just three dudes who showed up. They were important. They were important. And they saw that star when Jesus was born. They were there when Jesus was they were back in the east. Because they watched the skies, they saw that star. They saw the star. And they came from the east. However big their group was. And as you just heard, I believe we say three wise men because three gifts. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. But what if several gave gold and several gave frankincense and several gave myrrh? You see, I think one of the reasons that God had them come bring gifts, they were bringing gifts to a king, but also these were expensive. So when God told Joseph in a dream, take Mary and Jesus and get out of town because Herod's going to kill him, they had to have funds to go on. And God equip them for that before the time came. With what? Oh. Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These men, as good as they were, they realized they needed something more. They came to old King Herod and asked him, verses 2 and 3, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Now think about this. The star wasn't shining anymore. They saw the star from where they were and they went there, but the star wasn't shining. <clears throat> That's why they went and started asking, hey, where is he born, king of the Jews? Where is this new king born? Everybody's like, They go to King Herod. Where is he who's born king of the Jews? Well, that's a threat to me. I wish I knew too. Are you getting the whole picture here? How did they associate this star with a king? And how did they identify this with Israel? They were back in the east. They saw that star in the sky. How did they go, 
Oh, there's star for the king. It's in Jerusalem. You better go there. We even think about these things, right? They had a prophecy given by Balaam. Okay? And we can see this in Numbers 24, 17. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel to crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheath. We go, what? Right? How do we read these things and go, well, it meant something to somebody. What it did to these men in the east. Notice it says a star will come from Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And it says, and a scepter will arise in Israel. A star and a scepter go together. The wise men from the east knew this prophecy. So they came from the east seeking a king. A king has a scepter. They saw the star and knew that a king carried a scepter and a king had been born and came looking for this new king who was born in Israel. This disturbed Jerusalem and it disturbed old King Herod. When a very impressive delegation of wise men and their entourage converged upon the city of Jerusalem began asking questions, everybody starts talking. Everybody starts talking. Well, let me tell you, old King Herod, he first off wouldn't want somebody talking about a new king of the Jews, a new king in Israel. Are you kidding me? I'm the king in Israel. I've got to put a stop to this. i got to stop this. They saw the star. They were looking for the king. Right? Now, O King Herod, he, he calls for the scribes, and the, and the scribes, they're hair splitters. That's the best way to put them. They, they get so caught up in the letter of the law, they can't see the spirit of the law. So he calls these hair splitters in, and they're all just like, oh, we know the answer to this. Look at us. And so they quote Micah 5, 2, which we find in Matthew 2, 6. And you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What does it start with? And you, O Bethlehem. So they said the king will be born in Bethlehem. And they go to pat each other on the back. Oh, look how smart we are. We're so good. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in what we know, we forget we have to put it into action. These scribes that are patting themselves on the back, they should have been hitching a ride with a wise man to go find the king. Harry calls the wise man back in and says, Oh, he's been born in Bethlehem. Oh, please go find him for me. I want to come and worship him too. Make sure to scream, liar. Herod didn't want to worship. He wanted to kill. It was a threat to him. How dare this baby be born king of the Jews? We can't have that. Had he sent military in, he knew this baby would be hidden, be taken away, never find him. So his best bet, let the wise men go find him. Let them do my dirty work for me. The wise men had been en route to find Jesus for over a year, possibly two. They came a long way. They rode camels, and their people walked. They went and asked Herod because they couldn't see the star anymore. It wasn't shining anymore. Okay? Remember, Herod asked him, when did you first see the star? How long ago was that? Why? Because he wanted to know what age of a child to be looking for. How do I know they didn't see the star for a while? Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. 
the stars shine again, and we're here. Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down. They worshipped him. They opened their treasures and offered him gold, frankincense, myrrh. Let me tell you, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem is not that far. When we were there, of course, we're riding a bus. We're in Jerusalem. It's lunchtime. We're going to go to Bethlehem and eat lunch. We're like, that's got to be a couple of hundred miles away. About 15 minutes, we're at the gate, the wall that separates, and we're at Bethlehem. It wasn't that far of a hike, right? We all thought it was a long ways off. It's not. It's close. It's really close. So they go to Bethlehem, and the star shining. And notice what it says, and going into the house. Didn't say manger. Didn't say stable. They went into the house and saw the child, not the baby, saw the child with his mother Mary. You know, if there was ever a time that Mary should have been worshipped, it should have been right there. But those wise men didn't worship Mary, did they? They worshiped Jesus. They worshiped Jesus. Why did they do that? Because they were wise men. The wise men saw the star. They find Jesus. They worship. They present their gifts. Right? When they've been asking around, where's, where's this newborn king? Where is this king of the Jews? Where is he born? How many people did they ask? We don't know. Enough to make people nervous. They find the boy, Jesus, after the star shines again. They worship him. They present him with their gifts. Why gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, okay, gold, pretty easy to, fig to figure out. Gold is a great gift for a king, right? Hey, gold is a great gift for me. If you're looking for a special Christmas present, just saying, you know, just a couple of big bars. <laughs> that's all. But gold is fit for a king, right? So that's pretty easy to figure out. Why, frank, why frankincense? What is frankincense? Well, this is a product of Arabia. It was a white resin or a gum. And it's obtained from a tree by making incisions in the bark. And it comes out after they damage the tree. It comes out. It's a highly fragrant gum when it's burned. It was therefore used in worship. Where it was burned as a pleasant offering to God. It's, it is produced also in the East Indies but mainly in Arabia. So it's thought that at least one of the wise men came from Arabia. Okay? Why myrrh? Myrrh is also a product of Arabia, and it's obtained from a tree, a different kind of tree, but it's done much the same. They enter the tree, and it comes out. Right? Kind of like when you're trimming trees in our part of the world, you do it the wrong time of year, and, and the sap starts coming out. Right? Because the sap's coming up and they're going down. So it comes out and they capture this, but it gets its name because it's real bitter. Matter of fact, the name myrrh means bitterness. Because it's it just really, really bitter. But it's used in embalming the dead. Oh, well, thank you for bringing that to my kid. Right? It's used to embalm. It has a property of preserving from decomposition. It was, it was much used in Egypt and Judea. It was obtained from a thorny tree, which grows about eight or nine feet tall. And it was traded, it was sold in the early periods of, his, of history. And it was an ingredient in holy ointment. Is also used as an agreeable perfume. 
It also smelled good. Sometimes it's mingled with wine to form an article of drink. Now the Bible records myrrh showing up three different times in the life and death of Jesus Christ. When does it show up? Well, Matthew states the three kings brought it, right? And they brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Mark notes that Jesus was dying on the cross and somebody offered him wine mixed with myrrh to help stop the pain, which he refused. And the third time, in the book of John, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they brought a mixture of 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe to anoint the body of Jesus when they buried him. Three times in the life of Christ, myrrh shows up. Now, these offerings were made because they were the most valuable thing these wise men could bring from their own land. These are the most valuable things they could bring. They were all very expensive, right? These are important people bringing gifts to an important person. In those days, that's the way they did. If you read the Old Testament, King Solomon, they brought him billions and trillions of dollars worth of gifts. Other kings did, or queens. They would show up and give them enormous amounts of wealth just to have an audience with him. These three important men, they bring gold. Gold. I don't think it's just a little small, well, that's about an ounce of gold. That's good for you. No. I don't think it was gold. I think it was a lot of gold coins. And they brought frankincense and myrrh. And they didn't bring just little dabs. Why? Because God was preparing them to leave. Right? So these offerings were made. They, they, they brought this to the king of the Jews. That's who they went to see. That's who they went to bow down to. That's who they went to worship was the king of the Jews. Man, he was important and they knew it. These wise men came from a long ways off to bow down and worship him. These Gentiles, for such we suppose them to be, right? They, had to, they weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. They were the first to pay homage to Jesus. A token of yet undeveloped purpose of God concerning the Gentile world. They were the first Gentiles to worship him. All the shepherds had come, but they were Jews. Jesus came for the Gentiles and the Jews. They, Jesus came for you and me, right? They gave him the best they had. <clears throat> they gave him the best they could bring. We must give him ourselves. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And he is born again, as it were, into every heart that will receive him. The kings from the east were good men. And Herod wanted to kill Jesus. He was an evil man. <coughs> How are we going to react? We're going to be part of the wise or the evil. We're preparing to celebrate Christmas, right? One week from today is Christmas Day. Already. The older you get, the faster it gets here. When I was a kid, it took forever. It took three or four years between Christmases. Now it takes three or four weeks, it seems. Did I just put those lights on my house? It's very interesting to study this. Sometimes we get so caught up with the baby that we don't see the Lord. It's very interesting to study the facts concerning the first coming of Jesus and the second coming. Because as surely as he came the first time, he will come again the second time. Isaiah 60, verse 6, A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Eph, and Eph, and Ephra, all those from Sheba shall come, that shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news and praises of the Lord. And by the way, this talks about the second coming of Christ. 
And what's missing? Myrrh. Why? Because he won't be dying the second, second time. He's living forevermore. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. Wise men, not just from the east, but wise men all over the world follow Jesus Christ. Are we wise? Not to think we are, right? But wise men from all over the world follow Jesus. But there's no myrrh mentioned here. Gold speaks of his birth. He was born a king. Frankincense speaks of the fragrance of his life. But myrrh speaks of his death. And all this is indicated in the gifts that were brought to him at his first coming. His second coming, myrrh, will not be brought to him. Only gold and frankincense. <laughs> the next time he comes, he won't come to die on a cross for the sins of the world. He will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Romans or Revelation 17, 14. They will make war on the land. The land will conquer them. For he is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Let me tell you, he is the King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. Revelation 19, 11 through 16, For I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flame of fire, and on his head are many, di are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, of heaven arrayed in fine, in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, which, with which to strike down the, na the nations. And he will rule them with, an iron, with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me tell you something, when Jesus comes back the second time, there's going to be no doubt as to who he is. There'll be nobody saying, well, maybe no. And there'll be no one to try to get in his way because he'll have his army with him. And he is the king of kings. He is the Lord over all lords. What will our response be to him? What will our response be to Jesus? Will we accept him as the King of Kings and, and the Lord of Lords? Or do we just see a baby? Do we pay homage to him as conquering king or do we see a plastic manger scene? It's easy this time of year to get so caught up in the decorations and the gifts that we forget about the one who's born king of the Jews. We forget about the one that kings brought gifts to. What will our response be to him? What will our response be to him? They brought him their best. What they brought cost them a large sum of money. <clears throat> what do we bring to Christ? What does it cost us? You see, this isn't some easy religion. It's a free gift that will cost us everything. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Are we ready? Matthew 24, 40 through 44. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the, at, at, at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed away and would have let, would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of God is coming at an hour you do not expect. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 2. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall not, 
we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Oh, by the way, it's talking to believers. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. That's a powerful statement right there. He will descend with a cry of command. Not request, not a whimper, but of command. With the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be changed, or will be caught up to get together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. How many times do we encourage each other with the words of God? You see, it should be an encouragement to us that He is coming back. Read the book. Read the last. We win. That's an encouragement. As bad as things are on this earth, as bad as things are in this world today, we still win. Jesus is coming back. We will go to heaven if we're ready. If not, we're going to be like the one taken and the one left. Which one are we? You see, we all know those who will be taken up. And we also know those who will be left. I do funerals. I've done lots of them and some that I've done like the one I did yesterday he's in heaven I have no doubt I've known the man for years I've also done those that I know they didn't go to heaven let me tell you it's a heartbreaking thing when you know that person died without Jesus Christ an eternity in hell eternity not one thing we can do about it. The best thing we can do is tell those who are alive that aren't saved. That's the best thing we can do. We need to tell them. We need to tell them about Jesus. We can't wait. We don't know when that trumpet's going to sound. All the gifts you bought may be for nothing if the trumpet sounds. You don't even care about the gifts. Amen? Are you ready today? Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, we come before you today loving you and praising you. And Father, we just thank you. And Father, if there's anybody here who isn't ready, let them be ready, Lord. If we know someone that isn't ready, Father, give us the words to say and the courage to say them. To lead them to you. That is so important. Father, whatever it may be today. Whoever it may be. Father, let us be bold enough to speak up. There are those around us who are dying and going to hell. Father, let us be bold enough to step in their way. In Jesus' name.